All right, folks, we'll get started. All right, nobody's coming inside. I don't think we have any more chairs left, vacant chairs left. All right. First of all, welcome to reInvent. I'm really excited to be here. I hope you're also excited to be here. And thank you very much for attending this session on AWS CloudFormation. It's a deep dive session on AWS CloudFormation. My name is Anil Kumar. I'm the product manager for AWS CloudFormation. And for this session, I have my colleague. I'll let him introduce himself. Hi. You know, it's not that intimidating to talk to that many people because at least I know that I won't hear the people snoring at the back of the room. But my name is uh, Luis Colon, and I've worked with, uh, with Anil for about a year, and I'm a senior developer advocate for CloudFormation. OK. <laughs> OK. All right. So uh, when Luis and I were thinking about this session, um, we thought like there are so many things that we can cover in CloudFormation, so many features, so many different vectors are there in CloudFormation. We thought that, okay, let's get, get back to uh, the feedback that we have received from customer in last uh, three or four months. And based on that, we decided, okay, uh, we'll present on four themes uh, related to CloudFormation um, that our customers are talking about and they wanted to know more about uh, those themes. So our first theme is actually very close to system admin space. Uh, it's all about safety guardrails. Um, when you have one EC2 instance that you provision on EC, uh, AWS, it's relatively easy to manage everything. When you have two, again, it's easy. When you have 10, uh, it's OK. But when you start to scale, you, you, you need a few more tools to actually uh, protect your resources, protect your stacks from accidental deletes or unintentional updates. What you need is, apart from uh, protection, is uh, ability to monitor changes happening to those resources and stacks. So under the guardrails, I'll be talking about how you can go about protecting your resources from accidental deletes and unintentional updates. And also, we'll look into ways how we can monitor um, the changes that, uh, that are happening to your stack and the resources. So I, I, I'm going to consume around 30 to 35 minutes on this topic. Uh, the next theme we are interested in uh, showing you, uh, sharing with you folks is about stack sets. Stack sets is a feature that we released a couple of months ago. It helps you provision uh, resources across account, across region, using single operation. So Luis is going to deep dive on stack sets and will show you how, uh, in a very productive manner, leverage cloud formation to do cross account and cross region provisioning of resources. The third topic is very close to developers. Uh, as you might know, you, we have an API, validate API in CloudFormation that does validation. Uh, but it does only syntactical checks. It doesn't look into the semantics of your template. So Luis is going to talk more about how you can do deeper validation upfront before creating stacks. And the last topic is related to serverless. It's quite a phenomenon, right, serverless. Uh, for us, the reality is that uh, we are behind almost all the serverless framework. We kind of cloud formation powers all the uh, serverless frameworks out there, including our own SAM serverless application model that we have. So Luis is going to talk a little bit more about SAM and how you can model your serverless architectures uh, using cloud formation. Uh, from learning standpoint, let me tie it back to uh, what we are going to learn in this session. The first thing is protecting your stacks and resources from accidental deletes unintentional updates. Uh, we'll look into how you can monitor uh, your resources and stack from ch for changes. Uh, the second is we'll look into stack sets, how you can leverage uh, stack sets to provision across account and across region. Third is deeper validation uh, upfront. And the last one is how you can leverage CloudFormation to create your serverless apps. Uh, since this is a 300-level talk, I, I kind of assume that you guys know about CloudFormation uh, and are already using CloudFormation. Uh, can, I, can, can you guys raise your hand if you are thinking about using CloudFormation or haven't used CloudFormation at this point? Awesome. Not many. Uh, OK, but again, it's, it's very uh, good to take a step back and uh, talk about what is CloudFormation and how it works. So CloudFormation is an infrastructure as code service by AWS. 
Using CloudFormation, you can not only provision your resources, but you can manage the entire life cycle of those resources on AWS. How it works? You create your YAML and JSON templates where you define your configurations of resources that you want to provision on AWS. You upload those templates uh, in S3 bucket, and then you leverage uh, CloudFormation APIs, CLI commands, or CloudFormation console to provision those resources, what we uh, call stacks. CloudFormation is a battle-tested service and widely used by our customers. We have over 350,000 AWS customers using CloudFormation to provision their resources. As you scale on AWS, you will realize that AWS CloudFormation actually helps you quite a bit uh, when you're thinking from automation standpoint. Over 75% of our top 10,000 AWS customers based on high, their spend use CloudFormation to provision their resources on AWS. And we manage over 2.4 million CloudFormation stacks on behalf of them. We are releasing this public information. Uh, use this to supplement your uh, vetting process. If you're thinking about using any other infrastructure tool, you can use this to supplement or validate our, your assumptions. All right, moving to our actual agenda. Protecting stacks. There are actually multiple guardrails. Uh, to be exact, four guardrails that you can leverage to protect your stacks from accidental deletes and resources from unintentional updates. The first one is about uh, locking stacks. I'll be talking about the feature that we released a couple of uh, months ago, how you can leverage that feature to actually uh, lock your stacks from accidental deletes. The second one, a uh, well-known concept in cloud formation, stack policies. I'll talk about stack policies. Uh, third, I'll also talk about uh, resource level uh, permissions that you can set. In this, I will talk about deletion policy attribute that you can use to actually define the delete behavior of resources. Uh, last one again, well uh, uh, understood concept. Uh, it's related to IAM, how you can craft specific users and role to manage the uh, control of uh, your stacks and resources from updates. All right, so the first one is actually uh, stack termination protection. We released this feature a couple of months ago. Uh, the screenshot that I'm showing you is actually when I'm trying to create a stack, you will, uh, you'll reach a point, uh, it's an advanced section. In the advanced section, you will see termination protection and um, uh, the radio buttons. So if you want to enable termination protection on this particular stack, you just have to select the enabled radio button. And then when, once the, that stack is created or updated, under the overview section, you will see uh, under the level termination protection, uh, the icon and enabled. What it does is actually, when you try to delete this stack, your delete API call will fail. So what do you have to do now? So you have to disable the termination protection on the stack, and then you have to delete the, uh, fire the delete API call in order to delete this particular stack. So it's like an extra set of friction that we are putting in between you and that uh, delete call that you have. So uh, this, this feature is actually very critical. We have heard from, from large enterprise customers that it happens. Um, somebody new joining the team, somebody who is not aware that particular set of resources are part of CloudFormation, um, especially the production uh, stacks. You know, accidental deletes are part of life. So I think the one thing I can request you is that after reInvent, when you go back to your work, uh, consider enabling termination protection on all these stacks, at least uh, running production workloads. All right, moving to the second piece, uh, stack level policy. It's a very well understood concept. Um, stack, st stack policy is nothing but a JSON document that, where you define the um, control, uh, all, all the controls that you want to have on your resources or on the stack. So the snippet that I'm sh showing you is actually um, this policy will allow update on all the resource type except RDSDB instance type. So you can create the stack policy, you can attach the stack policy to the, to the stack when you are creating the stack or updating the stack. 
So this is one way you can actually go about controlling the update behavior on resources and policy. There are a few things on resource level that you can do. Um, I want to highlight here uh, one of the most important concepts that we have in cloud formation is deletion policy. We have seen time and again there, there are type of resources that you don't want to delete. Um, although you want to kill the stack or delete the stack, but you want to retain a um, particular set of resources. So in this case, uh, let's say you want to, you're deleting the stack that has this resource, but you don't want to, uh, you want to retain or snapshot whatever is contained in that volume. So you can use the deletion policy attribute and provide the keyword snapshot. One more important use case for uh, this is S3 buckets. I've seen uh, many times customers, they don't want to delete their S3 buckets. So what you have to do in that case is use retain keyword uh, for deletion policy. So CloudFormation will retain that resource and gut all the other resources present in that stack. And the last one is, again, a um, very well understood concept, IAM policies. Um, it provides you a very broad range of, I would say, tool sets, if you will, um, to actually control uh, your creation updates and deletes in cloud formation. So for example, this snippet, this policy, will deny all the create stack operations happening if this template has IAM related resources. So, so here are the four guardrails that you can actually use uh, to protect your stack from accidental deletes and unintentional uh, updates. I have seen customers, uh, some of the best practice, uh, customers who are implementing best practice, they use all the four to uh, provide that extra bit of guardrails. Awesome. The next topic for us is monitoring resources. Drift detection. It's one of the most important topics in cloud formation, actually. When you scale, uh, you have hundreds and maybe thousands of stacks, you have big teams, um, and uh, let's say you don't have uh, best practices implemented on how to go about updating stacks, uh, creating stacks, updating stacks, or deleting stacks. So we have seen quite often um, customers find themselves in a situation where where they, their stacks get drifted because somebody modified something on some day. So I'm going to talk about this drift detection. It's an important <coughs> issue for, for us and in cloud formation. And I have some good announcements to make regarding this topic. The second one is dynamic monitoring. Uh, the use case is, hey, I want to monitor certain CloudWatch alarms or certain vector, certain metrics when cloud formation is creating stack or updating stack. So we'll look at dynamic monitoring, how you can enable dynamic monitoring in cloud formation. And the last one is, if you want to record changes in cloud formation, uh, stack changes, configuration changes in cloud formation, you can uh, leverage one of the features that we have for your governance and compliance purposes. All right, configuration drift. Let's, let's uh, deep dive into this topic. So let's say you're a nice guy, you love cloud, you love AWS, you create JSON or YAML templates, you version them, you plan your changes, and you create stacks. So let's say in this case you have created like three stacks, web app stacks, enterprise stacks, and database stack, right? And then you have an army in your company who are actually trying to update those resources um, in those stacks that you created out of band. When I say out of band, they're not using cloud formation to update those resources. They, either they're using direct API calls for those underlying services, or they're using their respective consoles to update those resources. Uh, the thing is that it, it may happen that you are also responding to a time-sensitive situation, and you don't want to actually leverage cloud formation to update a particular resource, part of a stack, and, and you also go out of band. and change those resources. And yeah, in, in case of emergencies, you will break that proverbial glass to go out of band and change resources. That's part of life. Let me define configuration drift from the lenses of cloud formation, because I, I think that configuration drift is fairly 
well-known concept in the space of configuration management. So from the lenses of cloud formation, let me read this out. It's important for us to understand this. Any changes made outside of AWS cloud formation to one or more resources contained in a stack that modify the expected configuration values of resources would cause drift in the stack. What are the ways you can actually inject drift um, in a stack? Well, somebody can go out of band and modify property value of a given resource. Example, let's say you have a Dynamo table in a stack, and somebody goes out of band and changes the provision throughput of that Dynamo DB table. The second can be the default values, changing or tinkering with the default values. So when you create stack, let's say you don't specify each and everything. So underlying service and cloud formation assume certain defaults, right? So this may be a situation where somebody's going out of band and changing the defaults, but you can't see this because you haven't provided this explicitly in your cloud formation templates. And the last would be deleting stack resources. So you have done a DB table in that stack and somebody went out of band and deleted that table, right? These are the three ways you can inject drift in a cloud formation stack. I used a few things. I uh, just want to clarify certain concepts before I move on. It's expected value. The things that you have defined in your template for a resource and the defaults cloud formation assumed when you were creating those resources or updating those resources are called the expected values in cloud formation. The current values are nothing but the live configuration values that you would get for any resource when you make a describe call. Drift is the difference between the two, between the expected values and the live configuration values or the current values. All right, so the next important question for us is like why you should care about this drift detection thing. There are two things that we need to consider here. The first one is stack operation. I'm not sure if you have run into this situation or not, but if you have a drifted stack and you try to update in certain cases, your update, stack update might fail. Uh, even worse, the stack might move into a state where you're not able to update the stack or even delete that stack further. That's not a great situation to be in. This will lead to delays in your infrastructure updates. The second one is about audit and compliance, right? When you create, I've seen customers before creating template, they, they create the architecture, get it approved from their COE team, uh, center of excellence team, or their lead architects, and they convert that architecture into cloud formation templates, right? So everything is approved, and, and they uh, source control those templates, et cetera. They manage all those in a nice way. But if you try to update those resources out of band, you might end up in a situation where you have stack, which is, uh, not in compliance with the approved architecture. You have unaccounted changes and not reflected in your templates that you source control. So this means you have fragile change control environment and not good for compliance purposes, right? So what do you need exactly is visibility, right? This is the foundational component before doing anything. Before thinking about drift remediation, you need visibility first. You want to see the drift first, then think about anything else. So you need a way to actually detect expected values and the current values, and then you need a way to compare those, right? So from feature standpoint, you are looking for a feature that allows you to detect and view changes made outside of cloud formation to AWS resources managed by cloud formation. This is the ask. Let me take a sip. <clears throat> All right, so we are working on this problem, and I'm glad that I'm announcing this for the first time, that we are going to release cap drift detection capability in cloud formation early in 2018. I'm really excited to present you this for the first time. How many of you are, are actually excited about this feature? All right. Actually, I was gonna, pre I was gonna announce it, but I called tails, so. <laughs> awesome, awesome. 
I have a sneak peek demo for this feature. I have a, a few screenshots also to show you how this may look like in early 2018. Oh, all right, uh, before starting this, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a stack. Of course, it's a recorded one, so I'm not going to do a live demo. It's a recorded video. But let's say what I'm going to do is create a stack uh, with DynamoDB table as one resource. There's one more resource that I don't use in the demo. Um, I will describe the stack, can take all the meta information and see what, what we have there. I'll, do, I'll fire a drift detection call on that particular stack and see what feedback CloudFormation returns. So all nice cases, you know? In the second stage, what I will do is go out of band and change one of the properties of DynamoDB table. Then come back in CloudFormation and run drift detection and see what kind of feedback I get. In the third stage, what I'm going to do is remediate out of band. Like, I'll reset the value. I will undo my update on the DynamoDB table using one of the APIs, and then come back in CloudFormation and see if that drift is gone or not. And in the last stage, what I'm going to do is delete the DynamoDB table out of band, come back to CloudFormation and see what kind of drift, uh, what kind of feedback we get from CloudFormation. All right, I'm creating the stack called events. Fairly small stack, uh, DynamoDB table, and, um, and their logical ID is events, thing to remember, and event queue, uh, which is an SQS queue. I'm not going to use the second resource I'm going to inject drift in my first resource, which is the DynamoDB table. One more thing to remember at this point is the values of provisions throughput. Read capacity unit 20, write capacity units 20. I'll fire a describe stack call and see what kind of information we get. All right. You'll see a new section appearing in the describe call called drift information. Here it provides the last time when you check drift, detected drift on that stack, and the next attribute is stack drift status, not drifted. At this point, it says that your stack is fine, no drift in your stack, all good. Stack is clean, but I'm firing the drift detection call. Uh, this implementation is asynchronous, so it returns the drift detection ID. I use that ID to check the status of your call. And here you can see um, the status of that call. The detection status, detection complete, and the stack drift status is not drifted. So this, actually, this call checks uh, drift for all the resources contained in your stack. Again, describing the stack to see everything is fine. We shouldn't uh, detect any drift at this point. Nothing has changed on that table. You can see not drifted. Uh, the actual properties and the expected properties. If you compare, uh, you won't find any difference. So there is another section called property difference that's empty at this point. Nothing has drifted. Now I'm going out of band and updating the DynamoDB table. Here I am changing the values of provision throughputs. Read capacity moves from 20 to 50, and write capacity units from 20 to 50. All right. 
I'm going back to cloud formation, doing drift detection on that resource. Provide the logical ID events. That's the logical ID of that DynamoDB table. All right. Yeah. Now you can see here, CloudFormation has detected that the resource has been modified out of band. And in the property difference section, you can exactly see what has happened. The actual value is, which is the live value is 50, and the expected value is 20. So you expect to find 20 in your CloudFormation template, but the real value is, the live value is 50 at this point. And the difference type is not equal. I'll talk more about the difference types that we have in Drift. Let's move along. So modified for both the uh, read capacity units and write capacity units. I'm going to describe the stack again and see how things have changed. As you can see under the drift information, the stack drift status is drifted. So this, this describe actually gives you a broad overview, like what happened to that stack. There are three kinds of information right, you are looking for, right? whether your stack has drifted or not, if drifted, what kind of resource, resources have drifted, and if you have the second level of information, you will be interested in third level of information, like where in that particular resource the drift is. So this provides you the first level of information. All right. Going out of band again, updating that DynamoDB table, basically undoing my update. So I'll set it back to 20, those read capacity units and write capacity units <coughs> property values. This is like you are going out of band to remediate the drift. A firing detection, drift detection on the resource, DynamoDB table resource. All right. Not drifted now, right? Property difference, null, nothing. Your actual properties are equal to expected properties. Moving along. You can describe your individual resource type also. Here you can see not drifted. Now the last piece, I'm going back, going out of band, deleting that table, right? I deleted that table out of band. You're detecting the drift now in cloud formation. All right. So this is what you're going to see if you find a resource that's deleted out of band. Come back in CloudFormation, detect drift on it. You'll see stack resource drift status as deleted. All right, so this was mostly using direct API calls. I have a few screen grabs. Just gives you a, an idea of what this may look like in early 2018. So let's say the feature is already released, you are using it, you select a particular stack, right? Drift demo, you created, let's say, a week ago, and that time the status was not drifted, and you come back and want to see like, if anybody in your company has injected any drift in that status or not, stack or not, sorry. So you click on the Actions drop-down menu, you might run into this new thing that we will add, we might add. Detect drift for current stack, click on it. Non-blocking model will appear where, depending on the number of resources you have in the stack, might take from few seconds to few minutes to detect drift. Uh, let's say the job is done and the stack is drifted. Of course, at this point, you're angry like you were in vacation and somebody modified the stack out of band. 
So the star is drifted, and there is one link, view details. You want to know more about it, right? This is the first level of information you acquired. Stack is drifted, OK. What else? You click on that view detail, and you will land on a specific page on AWS uh, CloudFormation console, really uh, specific to drift for that particular stack. So let me walk through a bit here. Let's say you want to detect drift again on the stack. You can use this big button, detect drift for current stack, right? This is some meta information related to that stack. Important one, too, is status create complete is the cloud formation status. When you created the stack, it reads to create complete. That's the status, not to get confused with the drift status. The drift status is something different. Now you see drifted, that means somebody went out of band and changed something and the last drift check time. In this particular stack, you have two resources. Uh, both are of SQS queue type. One is the dead letter queue, and the other one is your regular queue. If you want to detect drift on a specific resource, you can select that resource. And once you select that resource, this button will get activated. So you can just, let's say you have a template or a stack that has like 150 resources, and you don't want to run and sit for like a couple of minutes. So you can just select a particular resource and then do drift detection there. So in this case, we are seeing the drift is in logical ID queue, right? That resource. So if you, if you can see, there's a small arrowhead. If you click on that, you will get this. Three sections. On the left-hand side, you will see all the expected information, all the expected values which consists of everything that you define in the template and the default values, CloudFormation assumed when it, uh, it created the resource or modified. The middle section is the current value. That's the live configuration value of that resource. And the last one, the right-hand side one, is the differences. So as you can see there, uh, CloudFormation detected three kinds of differences between the expected value and the current value. The first one is the red one, which is remove. Somebody removed read-write policy from that queue out of band. The second type, the yellow one, is the not equal type drift. Somebody modified a property value. So visibility timeout moved from 60 to 600. And the last one is green type, not super scary type, where somebody actually had a use case and added KMS related properties to that SQS queue. So these are the three drifts that you're going to see here. In cases of delete, let's say somebody deleted that DLQ, you will see nothing. You don't have the current value to compare with. So this is an indicator that somebody killed that resource. All right, so this is it. Uh, this is the foundational piece in whole drift management, the first is detecting the drift, providing you that visibility where you can take the information and decide what you want to do. All right, moving on to the second uh, theme under the monitoring is, is dynamic monitoring, how you can go about um, monitoring dynamically in cloud formation. We released a feature called rollback triggers. You can use rollback triggers to actually make cloud formation monitor CloudWatch alarms. If those are alarms, Fire, AWS CloudFormation will automatically roll back. Just to give a quick example, if you're building a rollback trigger, you just have to use a small JSON snippet, provide the ARN of that CloudWatch that you want to monitor while CloudFormation creates or updates the stack, and mention the value for monitoring time in minutes, which is optional. If it is zero, CloudFormation will only monitor while it's creating or updating the stack. In this case, it's 10, it means that 10 more minutes, monitor for 10 more minutes after create complete or update complete. Once you have created your rollback trigger, you pass that value or this JSON to the rollback configuration parameter. And that's about it. If while updating or creating the, the stack, CloudFormation traps any alarm that you have set in the rollback trigger, CloudFormation will automatically roll back. So there are use cases where you want to monitor the health of your stack while updating the stack. Let's say it's running some critical production workload and you don't want to take any chances. You 
can use rollback trigger to monitor your updates. And the last piece is actually recording changes for, let's say, historical archival purposes, governance and compliance. So you can leverage AWS Config. It's, it's a service where um, AWS Config uh, records all the configuration changes that happens to its supported resource type. CloudFormation stack is one of the supported resource type in AWS Config. You can use AWS Config to track historical and current and historical stack configuration. You can get notified uh, via Amazon SNS whenever any change occurs. Very good uh, if you have a use case related to audit and governance. Let me give you a quick example. So this is my timeline AWS config for one of my stacks. You can see the timeline. So I created this stack on 19th November, 1.47 da, 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 p.m. And then after that, I updated that stack three times. The, the first update involved seven changes. Config evaluated there were seven changes in that update. The second update, five changes. And the last update, three changes. Right? You can see uh, all the timeline here. Under the configuration details section, you can see all the meta information related to that stack. And the most important section on this page is actually the changes section. When you scroll down, you will see changes section. So I selected the last update. And you selected last update. Now I want to see what are those three changes that config has trapped. So there are two configuration changes and one relationship changes in config, right? The first one is last update time, obviously. It moved from ABC to XYZ. And the second one is, so what I did in that update is deleted that particular table. So you have something in from and nothing in to. You can see that resource is gone. And in the relationship changes, you can see uh, this particular table is no more associated with that particular stack. All right, so these were the three things under monitoring. We talked about drift. Uh, we talked about rollback triggers for dynamic monitoring. And the last one, we talked about how you can leverage config for your audit and compliance use cases. The last piece is uh, you also have a managed AWS config rule that you can use to verify whether stacks are sending SNS notification in config or not. All right. That's it on the guardrail side. I will hand over the baton to Luis to take you through the end. All right. All right. Thank you, Anil. Sure. So that's about the 30th slide. We got about 150 other slides. So if you want to stretch <laughs> your legs. Up, up. Kidding. No, there's, there's three other areas that I want to cover. Another one that uh, is very applicable to sysadmins, and it has to do with stack sets. So. Before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about what happens when your environment grows up. And you started perhaps a few years ago in the cloud, and we're putting perhaps three or four or five application stacks, maybe your more experimental ones. And before you knew it, um, your business got bigger, and you started to put a lot more production um, traffic on, on the cloud. Um, before you know it, um, you want to start leveraging things like multiple regions and multiple accounts. But from a CloudFormation perspective, uh, CloudFormation has traditionally worked in, in a way that when you deploy a template and you deploy a template into a stack, it's on one account and one region. That was then. This is now. But there's a couple of reasons why people expand to use multiple accounts in multiple regions. On the account side, sometimes you need to uh, restrict groups of users from using a particular application. It might be restricting your testers to a particular test region, for example. And from using geographically dispersed regions, you still have availability zones that can help you with availability. But it's often important when you have global applications to also use geographically dispersed regions. So those are some of the reasons to use uh, stack sets. In this slide, we wanted to show you kind of like an idea of what other Amazon customers are doing in the cloud in terms of like multiple regions. So you see on, the, uh, on column three and column two, small and medium-sized businesses with like perhaps a few dozen or a few hundred accounts and maybe a handful of regions. But as you can imagine, we also have customers that have a ton of accounts. 
So imagine if you had to create 10,000 accounts manually. That would probably ruin your weekend or two weekends, uh, assuming that you work weekends. Am I the only one? I need to talk to my boss then. Okay, so, so it's very applicable to even medium and small clients, but it's extremely powerful for very large customers. Now, existing customers already use and duplicate their application stacks across regions, but they've had to come up with other ways to address those things. So one way to do is to do it manually and ruin your weekend and your family's weekend as well. Um, or try to get automated with it and create home run scripts. But those can be error prone. Or you might choose to use an external tool, but then again, if the tool is commercial, you may add some cost to your um, application scenario. So that's not necessarily a great idea. So with stack sets, you can take a single individual template that represents an application stack and in one operation, deploy it across multiple accounts and multiple regions. The core concepts are these. So you're gonna have a master account that it's gonna be pretty much where you control everything and where you're actually deploying the stack sets from. Then you're gonna have a variety of target accounts. In many cases, your accounts will be a handful of them. In this example, we have three accounts and we're gonna target three regions. So you take the Cartesian product of those two things and that means that we will deploy in one operation nine stack instances. We also have an integration with AWS organizations such that if you collect, say, dozens or hundreds of accounts into an organization, then it becomes really easy to deploy the stack set with an organization ID. Now, the administrator account is gonna have an assumable IAM role, and the target accounts are gonna delegate trust to that admin account. So this opens up a lot of use cases where you can use stack sets. Just a few examples are, if you have dozens or hundreds of accounts, you wanna make sure that you set them up the same way if they're really meant for the same type of user. This is the kind of thing that can ensure that that happens. If you're deploying CloudTrade and enabling it across a lot of accounts and regions, if you're deploying config or config rules, or if you're deploying KMS keys, this becomes a lot easier to do it in a standardized way. You also can deploy and this is very important if you start thinking about uh, best practices like immutable servers. You don't want to deploy manually or with some scripts, servers that might be 70 servers or 700 servers and not be able to ensure they're all set up the exact same way. This can help you make sure that you don't have a lot of snowflakes out there in terms of like servers that have different configurations. And then for disaster recovery and business continuity, these are the kind of things that you can configure replication uh, across a whole bunch of regions and accounts and configure it the exact same way so they all end up putting uh, the information that you need to recover uh, in the same place. The same thing for read replicas for RDS databases. There are key operations with stack sets that are gonna be very familiar to what you have done in the past with stacks. So you're gonna create, update, and delete stacks in the same way you're gonna create, update, and delete stack sets. But you also have the additional option of saying, on an existing stack set, just go out there and delete a few of my stacks and redeploy them with another operation. There's a couple other options, and I'll talk about them when we go through the video here. Well, let me show you a little bit of feedback that we've gotten from some of the initial users. We uh, deployed this at the end of the summer, early fall, right? And we already got some really good reviews on it. Things like significant time savings, because you don't have to do things manually now being able to push your golden configurations, standardize your deployments, make it easier to be compliant with regulations. So there's a lot of good reasons to try this out. What I'm gonna show you here, this is the CloudFormation um, console, and I'm selecting stack sets, and we're gonna create a stack set. And to get you started, we have some fairly easy to use uh, default templates. Things like Cloud Trail, Config, the things that I mentioned before. We're gonna pick a stack set name. We're gonna be enabling Cloud Trail in five accounts in two regions. Look, my no hands. Um, you can choose to be notified via SNS, via email. We're gonna skip through that. This is what I mentioned before in terms of like we can 
have you put individual account numbers separated by commas, or you can leverage AWS organizations, set up your organizations in advance, and then take that organization ID that shows up on the right-hand side of the AWS org's user interface, punch it in there, There it is. Of course, extremely unreadable. Um, we're gonna pick two regions. And here we have some deployment options that are, that are really interesting. In maximum concurrent accounts, we can tell CloudFormation, if you're gonna be deploying hundreds of things at the same time, um, try to do it with some parallelism. So we're gonna tell them, enable it to deploy five at a time and then get the next five and get the next five to speed up the process a little bit. The second option, fault tolerance. When you're deploying a lot of these things, you might have some minor issue in a region, but you don't want to stop your whole operation. So in this example, we had it put fault tolerance of five. So it will, five operations of deployment would have to fail before the system starts rolling back your stack set. So as you can see, after entering only one organizational unit, we have five accounts, two regions, so the Cartesian product of that is 10. So we would expect to see 10 stacks with one operation. So let's go ahead and create that. So when you start creating, you, you get into this screen. And this is going to be your standard stack set property screen. We use a sample template. Um, we're going to be showing the operation that we have, and it starts by saying running. As soon as it starts to run, it starts to compute that product and starts showing you what stacks are going to, are going to be deployed. And you're going to know that it started because it starts setting up stack set IDs, stack IDs for all those stacks. But first, we look a little bit at the uh, template. And one of the important things is that you shouldn't assume that you have to create a much different template just to use stack sets. In many cases, the, in most cases actually, the templates that you already have, if you are building them correctly to not be region specific or hard coding things, should be applicable fairly well for stack sets. You can choose parameters and tags, obviously depending on your template and the parameters. And then we got our create operation running. As we scroll down a little bit. Now notice that we have, we are expecting 10 of them and we see five already that are current we started those five in parallel, so those are all completed. And the ones that show outdated, that just means that they haven't started yet. We refresh the screen, now all of them have a stack set ID or a stack ID, so you know that even the ones that are outdated are in the process of getting completed. And it should take maybe another, not even a minute there. So once all of the stacks, all the 10 stacks that we have before are completed, our operation shows succeeded. So how do we go ahead and verify that? So we used, in that organizational unit, five accounts. I could show you logging into all five accounts and proving that it's there, but take my word for it. I'm going to show you only one. Going through that account, since we did this stack set to set up CloudTrail, let's go to CloudTrail now. So what I expect for this particular account, because I selected two regions, that there's going to be two trails for the two regions, and then they are. You notice that they're identified by the tag stack set at the beginning, so we know that it's the operation that we just completed, and the, re the trails are in both regions. Pretty neat. And you can see the benefit of this with 10 uh, stack instances, but imagine the benefits that you can put in there for hundreds. And I think the current maximum for the stack instances is 500, correct? Yes. So that is stack sets. Now, when we were building this presentation, uh, we have a lot of CloudFormation users. Perhaps the more traditional ones are people that are coming from a system admin role, because you're setting up servers and things like that. But I think that most of you, most of you would agree that today, being a sysadmin, uh, you almost have to also be a developer, which also kind of justifies the newer roles that we talk about, like DevOps roles, where there's that balance of, as an application developer, you need to know the operational side of the house, or even more full stack developers that are expected to take an application from, from cradle to grave, if you will. So we want to start emphasizing treating these people that 
our, our handling, our templates and everything. It is, after all, infrastructure as code, so you need to treat it as code and do proper things like test and validate that. Now, when you get into development and testing, you can have some animosity between developers and testers. Have you guys ever gone through that? Never dealt with developers and tested? No? Oh, you guys don't have that problem. It must be only in the companies I worked on. I love the, the, the other tester here. We cannot spell bugs without you. So, yes, infrastructure. We talk about uh, infrastructure as code with CloudFormation. Well, yes, we need to treat it as code. And that means your code should be maintained in a repo. You can do this with, with our code commit tooling or with individual repos. You can tie into all sorts of other uh, continuous pipeline applications, build servers like Jenkins, Ansible, et cetera. And when you tie to those uh, job sequences, you can trigger test suites. In fact, one of the reasons why we wanted to bring this up is because we want to encourage you to do more testing and more automated testing with your CloudFormation templates. And one of the things that we've done is created a reference implementation, which I'm going to talk about here in a little bit. But some pieces of advice from looking at a lot of customers that are doing hundreds of these. Uh, build your validation scripts. Keep track what you're validating. You might have to vary the scripts for different environments, stage, business acceptance, production. If you're generating templates manually, writing JSON or YAML manually, then obviously you would write tests for that. If you're generating templates with a higher level language, like for example, if you're using Troposphere and building Python that generates templates, or if you're using Ruby and Sparkle formation, um, there's also a recently released one called Sparta that lets you do it in Go. Keep in mind that you need to not only write tests for your Python or Ruby code, you need to write the tests also for the YAML and JSON that you're generating. Also, try to stay away from having a huge template with a huge test at the end. If you can have smaller templates and intermediate test, then you get, uh, you save a lot of time not having to wait until the whole thing deploys and then run a test and find out, I need to roll it back. So small templates, really not unlike how you deal with development code and the principle of least responsibility or uh, the, the single responsibility principle that OO professes. So validation pipeline. If you go to that URL, which I expect you to take a mental picture and remember, you're going to get the slides too. Um, we set up an example reference implementation where you can run a set of customizable tests that include logical and functional integrity testing against templates and giving you a procedure to do it. There's many ways to do it as well, um, but at least this will get you started with the reference implementation in particular. We show you an integrate with a code commit repo and then it automatically provisions called pipeline, lambda functions, et cetera. So this is what it looks like. I realize it's a fairly complicated thing that we're showing over there, but if you visualize from the top left to the bottom right, what we're doing is once a, a, a commit is triggered on your repo, we run some logical pre-create tests, we run syntax checks. If you have not, even going beyond the, the CFN valid API calls, there's some other utilities that you can find on GitHub. One that I've heard mentioned a lot is CFN NAG. I don't know, have you guys ever used CFN NAG? Handful, okay, good. So you run your pre-test, really kind of like thinking about set up your pre and then your post-testing. Once you run your pre-test and they all pass, you launch your stacks in test regions, they run your post-test. If everything is green, send a notification. Here's an example of, in many places, you could let it go all the way to production, but in many places they want to have kind of like a manual push into production. That's fine, we can do that. This is an example of, we build this so that you can have that manual test. Once you know that all the tests have passed, somebody gets sent an email, they push the final button, if you will, and they put the fully tested version of those templates in an S3 bucket that you can turn around and push into your production regions and accounts. Now let's talk about serverless. And this is an area that's near and dear to my heart. Um, we've made a lot of progress in serverless in CloudFormation since uh, Lambda got released in 2014. And I think Anil mentioned before that a lot of the serverless frameworks that you see out there 
are powered behind the scenes by CloudFormation. And one point that I've also made earlier this morning in our workshop is that it's very easy to look at CloudFormation <clears throat> and think about, well, it's an automated way to create S3 buckets and EC2 instances for web servers or databases. But CloudFormation, after all these years, and with all these users, it can be used in a lot of application architectures. If you move in this slide from left to right, you'll see that you got your traditional, perhaps Java servlet applications or LAMP applications. If you are into containers, ECS, Docker, et cetera, you can use CloudFormation for those clusters as well. If you are into analytical applications, no longer transactional applications, maintaining database clusters, uh, real-time event streams, CloudFormation is also very powerful for that. In fact, uh, we did a workshop earlier today deploying an entire data lake with CloudFormation. And then you have serverless, which has become, as I said, very popular in the last couple of years. So as we approach serverless and CloudFormation now, looking back after a couple of years, we started with allowing you to set up Lambda functions um, like a core native resource, right? And then we work with the serverless groups here at AWS, and we came up with this transform, which is a serverless application model, which makes it that much easier to automatically, once you change your code, have a deployment package that you can turn on and deploy with CloudFormation. And then within Amazon, there's been a lot of other projects and progress that people have built on, on SAM. A couple that I can mention are, um, there's, there's this project that we put locally recently called SAM Local, where it starts allowing you to build and do a lot of your development in your local laptop before pushing it into the server. If you haven't seen it, I recommend you take a look at it. Um, there's also a micro framework that's uh, Python-based called Chalice that uh, was also recently released. But the service application model, now that it has a couple of years or a year and a half under its belt, used by a lot of people. From a CloudFormation perspective, it's implemented as a transform. It's optimized for serverless apps, so this is not the kind of thing that you would use for EC2 on the side or, or some of the non-serverless ones. You can use functions, APIs, and table, and then in the same template, you can have the transform, but you can also have all the other resources that CloudFormation supports. As I said before, frameworks have become incredibly popular. Uh, there is a, a place that I would recommend you take a look at in GitHub called uh, Awesome Serverless, and it has a list of all the frameworks, micro frameworks, utilities, sample applications. Uh, probably the names that we see as we talk to people in, in the serverless industry and now you know, having conferences now, I think this is the second year they've had conferences. Serverless, which is powered by confirmation, Apex, Up, and the one that I mentioned before, uh, Sparta, which is the one that is based on Go. And I think I also put Chalice in there as well. If you are not, um, I've done any research on this or learned about this yet, I strongly recommend you do so. You'll be surprised when we look at the internal stats for CloudFormation in terms of like how many resources are people using and the popularity of resources. Serverless is driving a lot of the growth of CloudFormation. So we're excited to continue to develop those both with AWS vended libraries and libraries from third parties. So taking a step back to this, again, system admin roles, developer roles, doing some testing, doing some automated testing, doing not only traditional applications, analytical applications, serverless apps. CloudFormation is in a position right now because of how long we've been working at the product that it can benefit many different types of users in many different types of companies, large and small, for traditional and emerging application architectures. Where to go from here when you get these slides? We've highlighted some of the things that we talked about before, including termination protection, as Anil mentioned, stack policies, deletion policy, and the guardrails, uh, using AWS config, rollback triggers, stack sets, validation pipeline, I strongly suggest you take a look at that. It will give you an insight of the kinds of things that we're focusing our attention on as we move CloudFormation forward. And then finally, with 27 seconds left, it means the world to us for you to uh, remember to complete your evaluations. We take this very seriously. We want to go back and, turn and talk to our developers and engineers and hopefully to get your ideas. 
Uh, we're totally out of time, but we're going to be out there for a while if you want to catch up with us. And um, we'd love to hear what you, got, you guys think. Right? Cool. Thank, Thank you very you. much.